What's up everyone, China Cycling here. Uh, today we're gonna to be talking about wearable tech, uh, the different options out there and the different metrics they can bring you. Let's get into it. Now, this video is sponsored by Rincon, but more on them later. Now, if you're anything like me, you love some tech in your life. Uh, I think most cyclists are also pretty obsessed with pouring over data. So as such, we all seem to be into our wearable tech. Uh, I've been tracking my heart rate in bike rides for about a decade and been tracking my heart rate and sleep with some sort of a wearable tech for about seven or eight years too. Uh, if you're not tracking your metrics off the bike, you really should be. It's when we're off the bike that our bodies recover from the stress we put them through in training. But if you don't monitor your metrics, you don't know how that recovery is going. Metrics such as heart rate variability, resting heart rate, and blood oxygen saturation can help us know when our body is recovered and ready for more training. Uh, likewise, if you're starting to get a bit sick but you don't have any symptoms yet, uh, monitoring your body's metrics may give you some early warning, allowing you to take a rest day instead of making yourself even worse off. So first, let's talk about some of the metrics out there that I think everyone should be tracking. Sleep. Sleep is where the majority of recovery happens, so it makes sense to track it. Uh, I think most people know at this point that sleep isn't just about quantity, but also about quality. Now, most wearables out there will track the stages of your sleep, and the corresponding apps will usually give you an idea of what percent of your sleep should be in the various stages of sleep, such as light sleep, deep sleep, and REM, etc. Uh, if you notice your sleep is getting disturbed a lot, then you can take measures such as blacking out your windows and trying to remove any sources of noise or adding some white noise as you sleep. Heart rate. So most of us track our heart rate as we ride, so it makes sense to track it after the ride too. Uh, your resting heart rate gives a good indication of your body's readiness and your overall health. Uh, if you find your resting heart rate slowly creeping up over a period of a few days, Maybe it's a sign you're taking things a bit too hard and should take a bit of a rest. Heart rate variability. Heart rate variability is maybe a little more complex than heart rate. Now, I'm no cardiologist, so I'll keep it brief. Uh, and if you're interested, there's plenty of research out there to go and read. But essentially, our hearts don't perfectly beat to a rhythm. There are slight variations between each beat where the heart beats early or late by a few milliseconds. Now, maybe counterintuitively, uh, more variation between beats is usually a good sign, whereas a perfectly metronomic heart rate, i.e. a low HLV, is usually a bad sign, uh, that your body is under stress and uh, reverting to its kind of super basic survival operating system. Now, an accurate HLV requires sensors that are running at hundreds of hertz or higher, so usually something you find on higher-end equipment and wearables. Uh, it's also a metric that many wearables use when they're giving you a, a readiness or a body battery kind of score. Blood oxygen saturation. Blood oxygen saturation, or SpO2, is basically a measure of how much oxygen is in your blood. And uh, there are two main uses for this for athletes. Number one is checking your recovery. Uh, if you're having a lung training block and you might find that you're waking up to see lower and lower SpO2 levels, uh, keeping levels above 95% is probably a good way to keep your training productive. Uh, if you find levels going below 95%, it may be a sign that you need to take a rest day or two. Another use for SpO2 is if you're trying to do some altitude training, uh, if you want to stress your heart to get the benefits of altitude training, you probably want to try to keep uh, an altitude where your SpO2 will be somewhere in the 88 to 92% kind of range. Uh, at these lower levels, your body will start to make the adaptations uh, such as creating more red blood cells, etc. Uh, off the bike activity. Another good use for wearables is for how much work you're doing off the bike. As busy athletes, we often have full training schedules and then schedule a rest day. However, on that rest day, we end up running around town doing all the chores and go on a hike with the family and then can't work out why we don't feel recovered the next day. Now, having a wearable to track your movement and activity 24 seven is a good way to make sure that your rest days stay just that, an actual rest day. So by this point, we know the benefits of tracking these metrics. Now let's talk about the different ways to track them. Uh, I'm gonna put these into three main categories, uh, watches, wristbands, and rings. 
Now, for watches, there are plenty of options out there. Uh, I'm currently using a Garmin Forerunner 255S Music. Uh, I've previously used watches from Coros, Huawei, and Xiaomi. Uh, and watches vary greatly in terms of their functions and the stats they can give you. So do some research. But as an example, this Forerunner retails for like 400 US dollars. It tracks pretty much everything off the bike, and you can obviously also use it for recording your rides too. Now, as cyclists, most of us have a dedicated bike computer to record our rides. Uh, but once you buy the watch though, the Goldman Connect app is free and no subscriptions needed to access the data. So $400, done. Now for wristbands, there are also plenty of options out there, but one option you see lots of cycling YouTubers promoting is the Whoop band. Now Whoop can basically track the same off the bike metrics as the Garmin, but there's no screen on the device. Uh, now with the Whoop, uh, the band is essentially free, but you have to pay a monthly subscription. The monthly subscription is $30 a month or $25 a month if you pay annually, but that's going to be about $600 over a two year period. So it's working out even more expensive than the Garmin watch for a product that in my opinion has less features than the Garmin watch. Now the third option that's only really became an option as the technology has matured is smart rings. Uh, the most famous one is probably the Aura Ring that came out in 2015. Uh, whenever I see these smart rings, I'm always blown away, you know. When you think of all the technology that is crammed inside, you've got multiple optical heart rate sensors, a Bluetooth radio, accelerometers, thermometer, a battery. Uh, it really is kind of crazy. Uh, anyway, uh, smart rings are kind of like the wristbands in that they don't have any screen, so you have to use an app to see and analyze the data. Uh, also, like the wristbands, they're more focused on the off-the-bike tracking. But like I say, not a problem for most cyclists as we already have a dedicated bike computer to track our bike rides. Now, smart rings used to be hella expensive. Uh, the latest Aura Gen 3 retails for like three or $400 depending on the color. Uh, so the same upfront cost as like the Garmin watch, but then they also have the subscription fee. So if you don't pay the $6 per month, you only get access to limited information. So if we use the same two year life cycle as we did before, the Aura Ring is gonna end up costing you about $540 over two years, depending on the color you choose. But, and you all knew this but was coming. Here on China Cycling, we like it when a new brand comes along and makes something more affordable. And that's where the sponsor of this video comes in. Rincon. Now, I'm going to get right to the headline stats. 149 US dollars, that's the super early bird price, and no subscription fees. Boom. Now, furthermore, as far as I know, Aura don't give you access to raw HRV data, but the Rincon does. Uh, it's also available in more sizes than the Aura Ring is, and comes with a cool, like, AirPod style case that you can carry your ring in as well as charger. Uh, speaking of charging, the claimed battery is five to seven days, and uh, so that's pretty accurate. Uh, on the default tracking settings that I've been using, I get six days of uh, use on a single charge. And then this little battery case can charge the ring also 18 times. Uh, doing the maths, that's about three to four months of continuous use if you use this case. So you'll have to excuse me, I've not tested that myself because I've only had this pre-production unit for about two weeks. Uh, and yeah, that's a good time to mention, I have been using a pre-production unit. So uh, my app that I'm using is also pre-beta, so there's obviously a few features that are still a work in progress, uh, but I've gotta say, I've been impressed. Like, it gives me all the metrics we've talked about today. So I've got my step count, I've got my resting heart rate, I've got my heart rate variability, I've got my blood oxygen saturation, and I've got my sleep tracking. Now. I have really small hands with skinny fingers, so I was worried slapping some tech on here would be super uncomfortable, but as soon as you put it on and you wear it for about two hours, you totally forget that it's there. Uh, the only time I, I notice it's there now is when I go to open a bottle of Coke or something. The ring stops me getting a good grip on the lid of the bottle, but like literally in two weeks of using this, that's the only time I've noticed it gets in the way. Uh, I've kept it on for everything, including like washing the dishes, going for bike rides, sleeping. Uh, maybe going forwards, I may take it off for bike rides just because when I'm riding the bike, I have my bike computer anyway that's tracking my heart rate. Uh, but so far, I've worn it on all my rides and it was fine. 
Uh, the experience for me has been positive so far. Uh, on their website, they have a measuring method that involves wrapping a strip of paper around your finger and then measuring the circumference of your finger that way. Uh, but they will also be sending out uh, proper sizing kits to customers before they ship the rings out. Uh, that takes out any of the guesswork though, so that's pretty cool. And now when I chose mine, I used the paper sizing method and it had me being a size eight. And the size eight is a perfect fit. Like uh, they sent me a size seven and a size nine, mainly so I could just show you guys the other colors. But I tried both on and the size eight was definitely the best option. So good to know the measuring method works. Now, when you do get a ring, uh, you pair it with the app. Again, super easy. It then asks you for your height and your weight and all that stuff so the app can kind of work out your calories. And then that's basically it. You just let it do its thing, quietly sitting there monitoring your vitals. Uh, like I say, all the vitals you can check in the app. In my version of the app, it's pre-beta, but even so, like some of the hints and tips in there that tell you how to interpret the data, that's really helpful. Uh, speaking of the data, I did some comparisons between the data of it and the data of my Garmin watch, and they were very, very similar, uh, especially the heart rate, steps, and oxygen saturation data. Now, the sleep data was sometimes a few minutes over, a few minutes under, but I guess the two different brands are using different algorithms. I've got one on each hand. Maybe I'll scratch my nose with this hand and the watch doesn't see it or something, but... Uh, the same goes for heart rate variability. The numbers from the two devices were often out by like 10 or 20 milliseconds, but they both had the same trends. I.e. when the Garmin HRV was going up, the ring con was going up as well. And when the Garmin went down, the ring con went down too. Now, I don't have a medical grade ECG at my disposal, so I can't tell you which one is definitely right, but I don't think it matters too much as you only need to compare the device to itself on a day in day out basis. Uh, you know, it's like having a power meter that's over or under by a few percentage. It doesn't matter if you're always using the same power meter day in, day out. So which method should you use for tracking your off the bike metrics? Uh, I think they all have their pros and their cons. Uh, the watch is a good all round option, but a good watch is expensive and you can definitely notice the weight wearing it day in, day out. Uh, the wristband seems like a good option, but the most popular option, Whoop, uh, just seems too expensive for what you get, in my opinion. Now, smart rings, I think, are a good option for people who want to measure their metrics, but want something that's small and non-invasive. Uh, if you have another dedicated device for measuring your bike rides, then I think the ring's perfect. Uh, if you do choose to go with a ring, well, I think the Rincon is the no-brainer. Uh, their Indiegogo is going to be launching soon, or maybe it already launched. There should be a link down below to that. Uh, obviously, Aura is an established brand, and Rincon are the newbies in the space. Uh, and like with any Indiegogo, you're committing to a project before it hits mass production. However, personally, I think the risk is worth it, considering the huge, huge difference in price between the Rincon and the Aura. Anyway, what do you guys think? Uh, do you track your metrics off the bike? If so, which metrics do you track and how do you track them? Let me know in the comments down below. And uh, okay then, China Cycling, out.